Hello everyone, welcome back to Hymn Lessons. Today, we're gonna to look at another modern song. Uh, today, we're gonna to look at Oh Praise the Name, recorded by Hillsong Worship, <clears throat> a, uh, a favorite here at Tannehill Valley. Um, so, let's get right into it. A little background on this hymn. It was composed in 2015, so very recently, written by Dean Usher, Ben Hastings, and Marty Sampson with Hillsong Worship. And the story goes, according to their uh, website, that they were trying to write a new song, and they were sitting down over lunch together, and they were stuck. But they decided that they wanted it to have uh, a hymn-like quality to it. And they spent an entire day writing just the melody of the first verse. So they met another day, and once again they spent the whole day just writing one short section of the song, and uh, a lot of time had passed, and it kind of got to the point where they, they put the song in a file titled May Not Finish. So they almost abandoned the song altogether until a friend of theirs asked, asked uh, Samson if they had any ideas for a new Easter song. So Samson decided to return to that song and began writing lyrics about the gospel story, the crucifixion and the resurrection and all the events surrounding it. And so from that, they wrote, Oh, Praise the Name. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, read the lyrics. Starts off, I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see His wounds, His hands, His feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. And then the next verse says, <clears throat> His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance seal by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. I'm trying to block the screen here. And then the chorus says, O oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. O oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise, O oh Lord, O oh Lord our God. The third verse says, Then on the third, at break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. O oh, trampled death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. And then it repeats the chorus. And uh, oh, praise the name of the Lord our God, praise the name forevermore. For endless days we'll sing your praise, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, our God. And then the last verse says, He shall return in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the night. And I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. And then we sing the chorus again. So it, clearly it's a, it's a telling of the gospel story from Jesus' death and His resurrection and then His second coming. Um, so let's look at how these lyrics line up with Scripture. So first, I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. So the, this is about the cross, and, and this is in all four of the Gospels. I just picked the verse out of Mark 15, 22, which says they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, place of a skull. Um, so Calvary, where he died. And then where Jesus bled and died for me, Matthew 20, verse 28 says, Even as the Son of Man came, um, came not to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. And then Ephesians 1, verse 7 says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then the next line, I see His wounds, His hands, His feet my Savior on that cursed tree. So I see his wounds, his hands, his feet. Of course, he, he, the writer doesn't mean literally saw them like, like Thomas did, but I cast my mind to Calvary and I see Jesus hanging on the cross, his wounds and his hands and his feet, um, my Savior on that cursed tree. So just thinking about what Jesus went through on the cross and that Savior on that cursed tree. So Galatians 3.13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hanged on a tree. So really the Bible says that Jesus was the one 
who was, was cursed. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. He became a curse for us. This says cursed tree. Um, it's really not a big deal, but just want to point out there is a slight difference in what the Bible um, actually says. So now going on to verse 2, his body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. So his body bound um, and drenched in tears. Um, in John 20, uh, it talks about him being bound in linen cloths before he was buried. Um, and the part about drenched in tears is not explicitly found in Scripture, but it's not unreasonable to think that, um, that, think that Jesus cried with tears, uh, reminiscent of Psalm 6, verse 6, which says, I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. Of course, it could also refer to those who were close to Jesus who wept over His death. Um, so, drenched in tears, not explicitly in Scripture, like I said, but it's not a big deal. Um, and then they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. So this is interesting. When I first heard this song, the first thing that came to my mind was Joseph, the, the earthly father of Jesus. Um, but, of course, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about Joseph of Arimathea um, in John 19, who took the body of Jesus to bring him to the tomb. And this uh, was a fulfillment of Isaiah 53, verse 9, which says, And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. And then the last two lines of this verse, The entrance seal by heavy stone, Messiah still, and all alone. Well, it's, it's just referring to the same thing that we just talked about. He was buried in the tomb, sealed by a heavy stone, and of course he was still and all alone. He was dead. Now the chorus... Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, our God. There are lots of examples in Scripture, especially in the Psalms, that talk about praising God, um, praising Him forever, uh, all creatures praising God. So I'll just give you one example from the Psalm. Psalm 86, verse 12 says, I give thanks to You, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. In another verse, Revelation 5, 13b, we looked at this last week, I believe, says, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. All right, let's go on to the third verse. Then, at, then on the third, at break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. O trampled death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. So the first two lines, um, this is of course about Jesus rising from the dead on the third day. And as I mentioned earlier, this is in all the Gospels, but I just picked Luke just to pick one. Uh, 24 verse 7 says that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. Now the next line, O trampled death, where is your sting? This is a reference to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55, which says, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Now the last line, the angels roar for Christ the King. There's no direct biblical support for this, but the angels did rejoice at the birth of Jesus in Luke 2, 13 and 14. It says, And suddenly there was with the angels... With the angel, a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom He is pleased. And then also they will rejoice at the second coming. Revelation 19, 1 and 2 says, After this I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven, crying out, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. For his judgments are true and just. He has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her uh, the blood of his servants. So we do know in the Bible that the angels rejoiced at Jesus' birth. They will rejoice at his second coming. So it's not unreasonable to think that they rejoiced when he rose from the dead on the third day. But the Bible doesn't specifically say that that took place. Um, once again, it's not a huge deal, but something to be aware of. Then the song repeats the chorus, and then we go on to the fourth verse. He shall return in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce 
the night. Um, this is another example of it's not exactly what it says in Scripture. Revelation 19, 13, and 14 says, He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. So the, the armies are, are wearing white. The horses are white. It says he's wearing a robe dipped in blood. Um, not a big deal that, it's, that this is not exactly what Scripture says. I mean, it could, it could be a white robe that happens to be dipped in blood. We don't know. Um, but with the armies in white, the horses are white. It makes sense to say robes of white. And then the blazing sun shall pierce the night. This is referring to, well, kind of a double meaning here. Um, the, the light of, of Christ, you know, piercing through the darkness of the earth, um, but also referring to the gaze, the eyes of the Lord. In Revelation 19.12, it says, His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on His head are many diadems, and He has a name written that no one knows but Himself. So, this is referring to the second coming, of course. And I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. So I will rise among the saints. This is about our resurrection at the second coming of Christ. Acts 24, 15 says, Having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. And then 1 Corinthians 15, 52 says, For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. Now this last line, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. This is just looking to Jesus. Uh, Hebrews 12, verse 2 says, Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, some translations say, uh, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. And then the song repeats the chorus again, which we already looked at. Um, so let's let's look at this. Let's look at the, the the theology. So first things first, do the words line up with Scripture? For the most part, yes. There are a few things in the song that don't exactly line up with Scripture that I talked about, how they're not things that are necessarily wrong, but they don't explicitly line up with Scripture. However, these are the kind of things that we should be, that we should pay attention to. Okay, I mean, like I said, some of these things are not a big deal, like robes of white, um, his body bound and drenched in tears. These things aren't specifically in the Bible. But we should be careful. We should always examine the songs that we sing because even though these are little things that aren't a big deal, sometimes songs have words in them that are little things, one little line that doesn't line up with Scripture, but it is a big deal. Um, for the most part, the words do line up with Scripture with a few little small things that really aren't that big of a deal. Um, all right, let's go to our theology scorecard. So is this song confessing? And biblical theology. Well, it talks about, let's go back to the lyrics, Jesus dying at Mount Calvary, um, the cursed tree, talks about his, him being buried in Joseph's tomb, um, talks about us praising him forever uh, in the chorus. We talked about that being in, in the Psalms and other places in Scripture. Uh, he trampled over death. It mentions that and talks about his return. So, does it confess biblical theology? Yes. Um, even though, like I said, some of the words don't entirely line up with Scripture, uh, this still confesses biblical theology and is the, the message is true. Is the song centered on God instead of yourself? Well, it says a name for God 21 times, and it says I or me seven times. So yes, this is focused on God instead of yourself. It's the whole gospel story and about us giving all of our praise to Him. So yeah, focused on God. Would this song make an Aryan heretic uncomfortable? Well, who does it mention? It talks about Jesus being our Savior. It says Jesus is the Messiah at the end of the second verse. 
Um, and then it talks about God in the chorus, God the Father, um, and then his return in the last verse. So it equates Jesus with God. So yeah, that's good. Makes an Arian heretic uncomfortable. Is there biblical gospel in this song? Well, yeah. It's you know this this song is all about the gospel story: Jesus' death, his resurrection, his his uh, his second coming. Um, yes, biblical gospel in this song. Is there biblical law in this song? All right, let's talk about this. When we talk about the cross, it is very very important, essential, that we explain what was accomplished on the cross. Did Jesus die just because? Well, of course not. He died in our place. We should have been on the cross. We're guilty of sin. But Jesus took our place to pay the penalty for our sin so that the righteousness of Christ could be put on us. And I don't see that in this song. All right, well, let's go to the first verse. The, the first verse is the only part that talks about the crucifixion. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. Okay, it says bled and died for me, but why? I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. It doesn't really say. It does say the cursed tree. It kind of mentions biblical law a little bit, but it's, it's just really not there. So I cannot give this, this one a pass. Um, and then lastly, is this song clearly addressing God in any capacity? Yes. So almost a perfect score. There's not really biblical law being addressed. It doesn't talk about our sin. It doesn't really talk about Jesus' atonement for our sin, even though it talks about the cross. And that I just don't like that. Um, this is not a bad song. I don't think it should should be taken out of our worship services. I still think it's a good song, but we need to be aware we need to know why Jesus died on the cross, the, the seriousness of our sin. Um, this is a song that works really well on Easter Sunday. We'll talk a little bit about the cross, but the main focus of the song is the resurrection and the second coming. We wouldn't, you know, we, we could sing this on Easter Sunday, but on Palm Sunday or Maundy Thursday, we would sing songs that are more focused on the cross and that really dive deeper into our, our sin, Jesus' atonement. Uh, the law, you know, things like that. So, just want to say it again. This is not a bad song. It did get a no on this one section, but I still give it a pass. Um, but just always be careful. And if we were to put this song in a worship service, we would want to have a song before it, maybe, that talks more about law and sin. So you have that progression. Now, the last two questions. Is this easy for an outsider to understand? Uh, yes, it's just very simply laid out of the gospel story. Jesus died, he rose again, um, trampling over death, and he will return, and it is our duty to praise God. So easy for an outsider to understand, yes. Is this theologically challenging for the believer? Not really. I mean, once again, these words are true, these words are good, but it's, it's the basics of the gospel story. Now, it's not bad to remind ourselves of the basics and remind ourselves um, what Jesus did, why he came to earth, but it doesn't really dive in depth theologically and, and scripturally into it. So I would say it's not really challenging for the mature believer. For the young believer, maybe so. For the outsider, yes. But for people who have been studying the Bible their whole lives, um, this song is pretty, pretty basic. Um, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. So, oh praise the name, almost perfect score. Um, now let's go to our Bible study and look at what it means to worship God. As we begin our Bible study today, I want to just ask a simple question, and that is, why, why do we worship God? Or better yet, why does God command us to worship Him? Look, God doesn't need our praise. God doesn't need anything from us, really. Um, so why, why do we worship God? As I was preparing for this Bible study and, and thinking about this song, Oh Praise the Name, I thought that I was going to speak on the story of the gospel because that's kind of the main message of, of the song. We sing of Christ's death, His resurrection, His second coming. 
and it includes some important details about these events. Um, but as I was looking at the words, something that really stood out to me was the chorus. It says, Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. Through endless days we will sing Your praise. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, our God. This, this call to praise our God is placed after each of the major events of the gospel narrative. So first in the song, we, we, we sing about Jesus was crucified and He was placed in a tomb. So how do we respond? Praise Him. Praise the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. And then we sing about... Um, we sing about Jesus rising from the dead and that He conquered death. So how do we respond to that? We praise Him. Praise the name of the Lord forever. And then we sing about looking forward to the day that He returns and raises us up with Him. How do we respond? Praise Him. Praise the name of the Lord our God. Praise His name forevermore. So clearly, if just by looking at this psalm, we can see that praising God is very important. But why? Well, first, let's look at a passage in the Psalms about praising God. This is Psalm 150. If you'd like to follow along with me, this is the very last Psalm in the book of Psalms. It says this, Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him according to His excellent, to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with trumpet sound. Praise Him with lute and harp. Praise Him with tambourine and dance. Praise Him with strings and pipe. Praise Him with sounding cymbals. Praise Him with loud crashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So, the book of Psalms um, is the inspired hymn book for, for God's people. You know, it, it teaches us to pray and to sing in a way that's pleasing to our Creator. So it's, it's fitting that the book concludes with a call for all living creatures to praise and worship Him. Many uh, commentators have noted that the placement of this psalm at the end of the book shows us the true goal of obedience to God's law. There are many psalms that show us how to keep God's commands and, and the blessedness that comes from that. But the Lord also shows us that law-keeping is not an end in itself. Instead, the worship of the Lord is the ultimate goal of our obedience. A life that's governed by God's law and, and therefore governed by all of Scripture will produce heartfelt worship. The purpose of God's law is to produce the adoration that we see here in Psalm 150, which comes from the hearts of those who have been redeemed and who are intent on pleasing and praising the Almighty God. If you look through the psalm again, verse 3 and 4, where it says, Praise Him with, with a trumpet sound and with lute and harp and tambourine and, and, and strings and pipe. These verses are telling us that it's necessary to praise Him with all different kinds of instruments. And then verse 6, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Verse 6 commands all creatures to praise Him. And the Psalms were not meant for the Jews only. You know, that they were written for all people. And for us as Christians, worshiping God in spirit and in truth must be the goal of our lives. But even though this is, you know, this is telling us how we should worship, why we should worship, this really doesn't answer the question, um, answer the original question that I asked, and that is, why does God command us to praise Him? Well, a couple of years ago, D. A. Carson wrote an article on this subject, and in in his article, he talked about his experience in ministry on college campuses. And he said that he got this question from a student once that, that stuck with him. He got this question in just the past couple of years. The student, who was not a believer, asked him this. Among human beings, anyone who wants to have all of the attention and garner all the praise, anyone who wants to be the focus of everyone's constant admiration, with everyone stroking that person and fawning all over him, will be thought of as massively egocentric. The God you were trying to push on us looks to me to be very egocentric. 
He keeps demanding that we praise Him all the time. For goodness sake, is He insecure? Isn't He, at the very least, morally defective? Now, as Christians, we know this kind of question is blasphemy, but if we really think about it from the perspective of a, of a non-believer, I mean, this is an interesting question. And, and Carson pointed out the fact that he had never gotten such a question before now because, he said in his article, the typical non-believer today is different from the typical college-age non-believer that he would have spoken to 20, 25 years ago. See, he says that up until recently, many atheists actually grew up in Christian homes. So these non-believers at least had an idea of who God is. The God that they didn't believe in was usually the God of the Bible. So they had a concept of a sovereign, transcendent God who is unique and deserves special attention. But now, that's not really the case for many non-believers. So we can't just assume that these people understand why God deserves praise. And, and while it would be a true, truthful response to that question to say that God is so much more than we are, that He's not just a, a human but, but better and He's not. You know, he's the king, he's the creator, he's the sovereign one. All that would be true, but there's actually a lot more to it than that. Um, the pastor, famous pastor John Piper, has made this, this point in many of his sermons. He said, because we have been made by this God, I'm paraphrasing here, because we have been made by this God and for this God, because our very self-identity when we are right with God is to love Him supremely, to adore Him and to worship Him. It is, it is a supreme act of love on His part to keep demanding it because it's for our good. The, first, the very first question and answer in the Westminster Shorter Catechism is this. The question is, what is the chief end of man? And the answer is, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. So our entire purpose is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. That's why we are here. What good would it do for us if, if God were to say, hey, you know, don't, don't give me too much worship. Don't, don't focus on me too much. I mean, that might satisfy an idolater's notion of humility. But the humility that's in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords was on the cross at Calvary. And that He keeps directing attention to Himself is an act of supreme humility and grace, precisely because He stoops to remind us of what we ought to recognize and because it is for our good. There is no insecurity in God, as that college student asked. He has no needs. From eternity past, the Father and the Son existed together and love each other, and they were perfectly content. But He doesn't demand that we love Him because He needs it, but because we need it. This focus on Him is not just because He is God, although he is God, and, and, and we should praise Him because of that, but also because out of love, it's what we need. That's the point. That is the point to which our adoration must come. And if it doesn't, then we'll just return to idolatry again and again and again. We praise Him not only because He loved us so much that He did everything that's mentioned in this song, that He left heaven to take on the form of a man. He died on a cross. He rose from the dead so that we can have eternal life and one day will return to take us home. But we also praise Him because He loves us enough to show us exactly what we need and turn our attention back to Him every time we lose focus and every time we fall into sin. Praise His name now and forevermore because He is all that we need and He gave Himself up for our salvation. That is why we should praise Him. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we praise You and thank You that You sent Your Son Jesus as it is laid out for us in this song. You sent Your Son Jesus to, 
take on the form of a man, died on the cross in our place, and rose from the dead. And Lord, we long for the day that you return and take us home. But until then, I pray that we would be faithful servants of you here on earth and that we would praise you and honor you with all that we do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.